this video, we're going to talk about some applications of MO theory. And while we're going to spend a little bit of time learning how to draw orbital diagrams for MO theory, more importantly, we're going to use MO theory to learn how to predict whether or not a molecule is stable, what type of bonds it has, whether it's single, double, or triple, whether or not the molecule is going to react with a magnet, and a little bit about whether or not and how we would expect a molecule to react at all. Before we get started, there are a few concepts and learning objectives that aren't covered in this video, but that are nevertheless important for understanding its content. So if you haven't yet been exposed to the basics of what is molecular orbital theory, and you haven't yet learned how to think about constructive and deconstructive interference leading to what we call bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals, I've got a couple links in the description for some videos that you can check out. Similarly, you should know by now a little bit about the basics of an orbital diagram, sometimes called also an energy level diagram. And at this point, you should be able to draw energy level diagrams for isolated atoms using the Aufbau principle, Hund's rule, and the Pauli exclusion principle, which tells us how to fill up electrons in an orbital diagram, starting from the bottom, going to the top, and if we have electrons that are going into the same subshell, with the same energy that we fill them up one at a time, spin up first before we go and backfill electrons. If you're good with those, let's go ahead and dive in. So orbital diagrams in MO theory look like the typical energy level diagrams that you've seen for atoms, just with a little bit more um, accessories to them. So in an MO theory style orbital diagram, what we're gonna show is a couple of different features. First off, we are gonna show what is happening in a particular molecule. That's always the center section of the diagram. And so in this center section of the diagram, we are gonna display everything that's happening with the molecule itself. That in this part of the diagram, we're gonna show the bonding orbitals. We're gonna show the anti-bonding orbitals which are always notated with a star so that you can tell bonding versus anti-bonding orbitals apart. And depending on who's drawing the diagram, sometimes they'll also give you photos or small sketches of the orbitals themselves. And so in a simplified MO diagram, this is all that you have to show. And to depict this H2 molecule, we just need to show that H2, which has a total of two electrons, is going to fill its electrons using the Aufbau principle bottom to top, which means that it's going to have two electrons in the bonding orbital and zero electrons in the antibonding orbital. I do want you to see some features of MO diagrams that you might see in your textbook and that provide supplementary information about what's happening in this molecule, but that nevertheless can be sometimes confusing for students. In particular, sometimes you'll see these wings of the diagram depicted. This is going to be the left and right sections of the diagram, and these are sort of reference diagrams that are helping us understand what the orbital diagram looked like for the isolated atoms before they formed the molecule. This is helpful because it lets us see that the bonding orbitals are lower in energy than the original atomic orbitals and that the anti-bonding orbitals are way higher in energy than the original uh, the isolated ad atomic orbitals. The wings are also confusing though because if you look at the wings you might think that somehow there's four electrons in this molecule when in reality there are only two. And so what I like to tell students is that these more complicated versions of the diagrams sort of represent a before and after picture where the before picture, the left and the right hand sides of the diagram, show us what the atoms looked like before they formed the bond, but the center of the diagram, the most important part of the diagram, that's what shows us what the molecule looks like now. If that wing before and after picture looks too confusing for you, I would encourage you to just think in terms of this simplified model where all we're showing is the orbitals that pertain to the molecule itself. And so what we can see is that in this diagram, we get a sense of where the bonding orbitals are, where the anti-bonding orbitals are, and then really importantly, where the electrons are. 
but I want to show us an MO diagram for a slightly more complicated molecule so that we can start to talk about principles and properties of MO diagrams and why it is that we bother showing you these more complicated models. So this right here is an MO diagram for the molecule O2. And just like we practiced for atoms, if we're drawing this more complicated style of the diagram, we can start by drawing our before picture. Um, here I'm only showing the valence orbitals, the 2s and the 2p level. So I'm going to fill these orbitals with the valence electrons for oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons, giving rise to this electron filling. And because I have two oxygens, I have to do the same thing on the right-hand side of the diagram. The center shows us what the resulting molecular orbitals are going to look like. And the good news for y'all is that you are not on the hook for having to generate what these orbitals look like. I just want us to be able to understand how to fill them with electrons and how to recognize a few properties that are going to be true in any MO diagram. So the first property be, to be aware of is that the number of electrons that we had in the original two atoms is always going to be exactly equal to the number of electrons that we have once the molecule is formed. That shouldn't be too surprising. That's the same thing we did in Lewis theory. So if we're filling up electrons into this O2 molecule, if I had six electrons for each oxygen, I need to put a total of 12 electrons into this molecule. Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And so you can see that not only in a more complicated molecule like this have we populated the bonding orbitals, but in some cases we were forced to populate the antibonding orbitals. We're going to talk more about that in a second and why it's so important for thinking about molecular stability. The next thing I want us to notice is that not only is the number of electrons in the atoms equal to the number of electrons in the molecule, but also the number of orbitals that we started with is exactly equal to the number of molecular orbitals that form. And so I have a total of eight atomic orbitals that are shown on the wings of the diagram. And maybe we can navigate over here to our more simplified version of the diagram. And you can see that we have the exact same number. We again have eight molecular orbitals. And that is not a coincidence. And we're gonna see that that holds true for any molecular orbital diagram that you ever see. Another feature of MO diagrams that I want to point out is that whenever you have a bonding and an antibonding pair, you'll notice that compared to the atomic orbitals, the bonding orbitals are always more stable than the at original atomic orbitals. The antibonding orbitals are less stable, but the effect for the antibonding orbitals is always way more dramatic. And so those antibonding orbitals are way destabilized, whereas the bonding orbitals are just a little bit stabilized. And so if you fill up all of the orbitals, molecular orbital theory tells us that it sort of cancels out and it's repulsive. And molecules um, that have all of their electrons populated in the MO diagram tend to not be stable and tend to not be observed experimentally. Okay, and then last but not least, there are a few things that are just as true of MO diagrams as they are of atomic orbital diagrams. Namely, each orbital in a molecular orbital diagram can hold two electrons, so the Pauli exclusion principle is still true. We still fill the electrons bottom to top, lowest energy to highest energy, so the Aufbau principle is still true. And in a molecule like O2, if we're trying to fill up electrons into two different orbitals that have the same energy level, we're going to fill them one at a time before we go and backfill them. So Hunt's rule is still also true. All right, so why do we bother making a diagram like this? It's because there's a lot of chemical insight that we can get from this O2 molecule. The first thing I want us to see is that using an MO diagram, we can talk about molecular stability. Namely, there are more electrons in this particular example in bonding orbitals than there are in the antibonding orbitals. So that means that this molecule is stable. In other words, this help explains why oxygen is not normally found as isolated atoms, but more commonly as a diatomic molecule. And this is in contrast to other noble gases that like to be monatomic, like neon or argon.
If we want to make this argument more quantitative, we can go ahead and calculate something called bond order. Conceptually, bond order means the same thing that it meant during Lewis theory. It means the same thing that it meant during valence bond theory, which means a bond order of one corresponds to a single bond, a bond order of two corresponds to a double bond, and a bond order of three would correspond to a triple bond. It's just that in MO theory, how we're going to calculate bond order is a little bit different. We're going to use the formula B, the bond order, is equal to 1 half times the number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals. So looking at our O2 molecule here, how we know an electron is in a bonding orbital is because the symbol next to the orbital will not have a star. Antibonding orbitals do have the stars. And so I can count up my number of bonding electrons. Um, we've got 2, 4, six, eight electrons that are present in the bonding orbitals, and then now counting electrons that are in the antibonding orbitals, two, three, four. Plugging that into my formula, I get for oxygen that the bond order is equal to one half times eight minus four, which is two. And good news, in this particular case, that exactly correlates with what we would have expected from drawing the Lewis structure of O2. And so this, in this case, our Lewis theory and our molecular orbital theory are really trying to tell us the same thing, just in slightly different ways. Just like with Lewis structures, higher bond orders correlate with stronger bonds and shorter bonds versus lower bond orders, which correlate with weaker and longer bonds. Let's talk a little bit about magnetic properties in MO theory, um, because this is where we're going to start to see some breakdown of Lewis structures and Lewis theory and some advantages of MO theory. In terms of definitions and terms to know, I'd like us to remember the terms paramagnetic and diamagnetic. When a molecule has unpaired electrons, um, that means that it is going to interact with a magnet. You're probably used to seeing this for things like iron, which has lots of unpaired electrons, but it turns out molecules can also be paramagnetic. And based on the IMO diagram that we just drew for O2, because of these unpaired electrons that are present in this orbital, which I've labeled pi star 2p, that means that we would expect O2 to be paramagnetic. And indeed it is. There's a link in the description of this video that will show you how O2 reacts with a magnet. But if you're, in, if you're taking Chem 112 this semester, you'll also get to see it in class. By contrast, some molecules and some atoms don't have any unpaired electrons. And so at right, I'm showing an MO diagram for N2. The big difference between the MO diagram for O2 and N2 is just that they have different numbers of electrons in them, which makes sense because nitrogen has a total, N2 has a total of 10 electrons, five from each nitrogen atom. But you'll notice that the nitrogen molecule doesn't have any unpaired electrons. So the term we use for something like this is we call it diamagnetic. And diamagnetic molecules tend not to interact with um, with magnets. And so what I want to point out as one example of where we really need MO theory to understand molecular behavior is that if you simply drew the Lewis structures for O2 and N2, it looks like in both cases, you know, we call them lone pairs because it seems like all the electrons are paired. But it's MO theory that tells us that in fact, with O2, maybe it would have been a better idea to draw some of these electrons as isolated to show where this paramagnetism of O2 is coming from. We would never be able to predict this based on a Lewis structure, and that's okay, but it shows us why sometimes we need MO theory, particularly when it comes to understanding why certain things are magnets and why other things just aren't. Our last topic for today is that we're going to talk a little bit about chemical reactivity. And most of the time, um, we wait to tell you about these things until your organic chemistry class. But I think since we're talking about MO theory, I'm going to introduce to us two new terms that are going to become really important in organic chemistry for talking about chemical reactivity. And those two terms are HOMO and LUMO. So HOMO in molecular orbital theory 
represents the highest occupied molecular orbital. In other words, it's the orbital, or if there's a tie, orbitals, that have at least one electron and that are the highest energy orbital to do so. Remember that in these energy level diagrams, the y-axis always represents energy. So basically, we're looking for the topmost orbital that contains at least one electron. For a molecule like O2, you can see that it's our pi star 2p orbitals that are considered the homos. And for a molecule like N2, it would instead be this sigma 2p that would be considered the homo. A related term is LUMO. So LUMO represents the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. In other words, we're still looking for the highest energy orbital that meets the criteria, but now the criteria is that we want the orbital to be unoccupied. And so for O2, in this case, our LUMO would be the sigma star 2p, which happens to be an antibonding orbital. And for N2, since we're looking for the lowest energy orbital that meets this criteria, it would be the pi star 2p orbitals that are considered to be the LUMO. We unfortunately won't have a ton of time to talk today about why these types of orbitals are so important for chemical reactivity, but you are going to talk about it a lot in your organic chemistry class. And what I'll kind of hint at for now is that when it comes to molecules undergoing further reactions, sometimes they like to give up electrons, sometimes they like to receive electrons. When they give up electrons, they always give up the electrons from their HOMO. And when they receive electrons, they always receive electrons into their LUMO. And so I'll leave you with that so that when you next semester take organic chemistry, you can be ready for some of those features and some of that terminology. So that's it for this video. I have a couple of takeaways for us. One is that you've probably seen that compared to the other theories that we've dealt with this chapter, like Lewis theory or valence bond theory, MO theory is definitely more accurate. It has better predictions compared to experiment, but it's also more complicated. And so oftentimes the job of the chemist is to use the simplest model possible that will help explain what's happening in reality. And that means in practice, chemists like to use Lewis theory, valence bond theory, and MO theory, depending on the context. The second thing we hopefully saw in this video is that MO theory gives us a really accurate way to measure a molecule's bond order and its magnetic properties. We call it paramagnetic if it has unpaired electrons, and we call it diamagnetic if there are no unpaired electrons. And then last but not least, we should be aware of what the terms HOMO and LUMO mean as they pertain to a molecular orbital diagram because this tells us how chemical reactivity is going to occur and how this molecule might further react down the road. HOMO stands for the highest occupied molecular orbital. LUMO stands for the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And so with that, that's all we've got for today, and I will see you all in class.